get your favorite shows automatically downloaded to your computer. For more information, go to kpfa.org, KPFA Podcasts, or your favorite show to go. This is KPFA or KPFB Berkeley or KFCF Fresno. Coming up, it's About Health with our host, Rachel Bryant. Please stay with us. Good afternoon and welcome to About Health. I'm your host today, Rachel Bryant. It's been a couple of months since I've been on the air with you, and so I'm glad to be back. And um, we have a great show lined up today. We're going to be talking about environmental toxins in the water, air, and food that we take in, and a very interesting subject, one that I'm uh, curious to learn more about. My guest today, Dr. Cecilia Hart. She's a naturopathic doctor here in Berkeley. Um, she has graduated from the oldest naturopathic medical school in North America, the National College of Naturopathic Medicine, and she's also a graduate of Stanford University. And just welcome to the show today, Dr. Hart. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be here. So, again, we're going to be talking about environmental toxins, and, and my first question is, how did all this junk get into our water, air, and food? Well, currently, there are 260 million pounds of chemicals discharged into the surface water. That's lakes and rivers. There are 2 billion pounds of emissions pumped into the air via car emission and uh, burning of coal. And about 400 different pesticides are currently licensed by the uh, Food and Drug Administration uh, for use in our food crops. And has this always been the case? I mean, when did this conversation about environmental toxins begin? Was it in the last decade, last 50 years? I would say it's certainly been much worse uh, in the last century and exponentially greater in the last few decades. And what has fueled the change from, I guess, living naturally to having all of this, these toxins in our food and air? Uh, certainly, uh, things like emission, carbon monoxide, ozone, nitrogen dioxide, which are components, again, of, you know, vehicle uh, emissions, as well as the emphasis on, you know, increasing production of foods so that we're putting a lot of pesticides and different chemicals and uh, just things to increase the production versus the quality of what we're taking into our bodies. And let's just break those three out a little bit. We talked about it being in our water, our air, and our food. So how does it show up in our water? How does it get there? And then um, how does it show up in our bodies once we once we get get it through our water supply? So in the water, you're getting it primarily from soil runoff, again, uh, treating uh, crops with herbicides and pesticides. Uh, as well as heavy metals, which are lying the pipes, um, both um, that Edmud uses and that we have in our homes. Uh, nitrates, which are a human and animal waste uh, that get into the fertilizer and this an- that and fertilizer get into the soil. And then hormones, as well as now antibiotics, are showing up in our water supply. In the water supply? Yes. When people flushing, you've consumed, your body doesn't completely use all of it and break it down. So you flush and it goes into the water supply. That's pretty scary. And then what about the air? You talked about car emissions and things like that. Um, it's just a scary prospect to me to know that the air we breathe is toxic. Uh, yes, well, we've done a lot to make that situation worse. Certainly having less trees, and trees are natural fil- filters uh, for our air, and the less trees that we have in our communities and our environments, the more toxic the air also is. So could one improve the quality of the air in their house? Say I've heard that house plants mm-hmm. might improve. Is that true? I mean, does it dramatically improve if you have house plants or, or plants in your around your house? A certainly significant increase as well as something called a HEPA filter. And that's really, I mean, there are many filters on the market, but I think that's the one that we know uh, that we have research to back up that actually pulls some of the toxins out of the air effectively. And then I think a lot more people are familiar with um, 
toxins in our food or there's a lot more talk about organic versus non-organic mm-hmm. food and pesticides being in our food and antibiotics in particular and hormones being in our meat. So talk a little bit about that, just our food quality and Sure. Uh, we can start with fish. I mean, there's some wonderful qualities of fish and fish uh, that has not been contaminated uh, by the human uh, footprint on the planet is wonderful. But unfortunately, a great deal of the fish now uh, concentrates things like mercury, PCBs and dioxins. Uh, so we're looking at fishes that have the highest concentration of those, things like swordfish and shark, mackerel, uh, tunas, bass. And um, some of the fishes that are lower in are things like salmon, cod, haddock. And then speaking of fish, what's the difference in fish that is like caught in the wild or caught or farm raised? I've heard that term used. And is there a difference in quality between those two? And absolutely, absolutely. The farm raised, um, we can look at salmon, for example. Uh, They'll actually put dyes in it afterwards so it looks more like natural salmon. Salmon gets its natural color from the other seafood and algae that it eats that provide a great deal of antioxidants as, as well as highest quality oils that are essential for the functioning of our cells. And then what about some of the um, things that are in produce? Because I think a lot of people are beginning to make a more conscious step toward eating more fruits and vegetables and um and there's been a lot of campaigning toward getting people to eat more fruits and vegetables, and so, but some of them can do more harm than good. Are there particular ones that maybe contain more contaminants than others? And uh, absolutely. Pesticides in particular have been linked to things such as uh, certain cancers, including leukemia, liver and pancreatic, as well as bladder cancer and certain anemias uh, and pesticides are highest in certain produce. So I have three words, organic, organic, organic. (laughs) And uh, the foods that are most contaminated if you are buying non-organic are things like strawberries, peppers, spinach, cherries, peaches, cantaloupe, celery, apples, green beans, grapes. um, And so those are the foods if you were going to say you're on a budget and low berkeley is a great place for finding reasonably priced organic produce but if you are on a budget and you can only buy some of your produce that's organic i would try to stick to those particular foods and you know i've even heard that even organic produce all the, that isn't necessarily true because an organic field may be right next to a non-organic field and sometimes there's just chemicals that blow over or run off and things like that. So um, it certainly is a better option to buy organic when you can and um, perhaps even go back to the old-fashioned gardening. I know when I grew up, my family always had a garden and at least some of our produce came right out of our backyard. I don't know how safe that is now um, Mm -hmm. because of the issues you said with uh, things being in the soil. Um, But certainly getting back to nature and organic as much as possible. That, too, is like a new conversation. I mean, I don't know that my grandmother sat around and talked about organic produce, so... (laughs) Yeah, so there's certain things we can do to improve the quality of the soil. Uh, oh. And so using calm natural compost and uh, things where you're not doing things that deplete the natural nutrients from the soil. But yes, I mean, even, you know, cities, um, I'm sorry, patients that live in, you know, in very urban environments, I suggest just simply having a window box where you can at least have, you know, certain herbs that can help with uh, detoxification. But ideally, yes, growing our own or having a community supported agriculture system or, uh, you know, the farmer's market are a larger example of that. But I do think that that really is the key. You're listening to About Health. Our guest today, Dr. Cecilia Hart. She's a naturopathic doctor here in Berkeley, and we're talking about environmental toxins. I want to back up just a little bit and tell me what it means to be a naturopathic doctor. It's an ND mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to an MD. And tell me some about your practice and, and how it's unique. 
Okay. Uh, naturopathic doctors are primary, trained as primary care doctors. We attend uh, four-year um, post-undergraduate medical schools, and we also have in-residency training. There's a lot of patient contact in, in the development of our skills. I think the primary difference uh, from MDs is that each class, you know, from day one, we're discussing natural ways to solve whatever the health uh, issue is. Uh, we have, you know, we do all the same ologies, pathology, neurology, uh, certainly anatomy, biochemistry, but our emphasis on treatment is always starting with the least invasive, uh, understanding that the body is designed to be able to correct most imbalances and working with the body to do that. But also, uh, we do a lot of research and there's a lot of research backing up in you know, the use of natural products and understanding the biochemical pathways, just using natural things to correct those biochemical imbalances as opposed to synthetic pharmaceuticals. And give me an example of some of the natural modalities or, or um, prescriptions that you might use or, or healing methods that you might employ. Uh, certainly, uh, since we're discussing uh, environmental toxins, some of the things that we address uh, are diet, as we discuss the organic produce, and there's certain foods that are particularly more beneficial for detoxing, some of those foods are things in the brassica family called cruciferous vegetables. Those are things like broccoli and cauliflower, uh, certain pro kinds of protein powder, particularly the whey protein powder. If someone doesn't have a sensitivity to that, that's much better for um, doing liver detoxification. Uh, there's certain herbs, um, and I do... Uh, botanical herbs both from from the West as well as I studied in China, so I use Chinese herbs as well as Ayurvedic in my practice. Uh, and the one I'm interested in is learning more about the homeopaths. I know that you also use homeopaths, and could you explain what those are and 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 how they're used? And for a simple, just a simple explanation. I know that it's yes. a complex system. You know, I think I, the honest answer is that homeopathy, I don't think are... Our Western brains are sophisticated enough yet to understand the complexity of homeopathy. But homeopathy does have its roots in ancient Egyptian medicine as well as the classical Chinese medicine. The principle uh, of using a small amount of an herb or substance uh, versus using a large amount of that same substance and giving you an opposite response uh, or, or the principle of like cures like, we're using a minute amount of a substance to get something to work uh, more efficiently, uh, has its roots in many indigenous cultures. But I think in current day, we're seeing uh, the most science-based research regarding that at uh, places both at Stanford University has done some studies, but also I think Germany is probably the most efficient right now in terms of producing homeopathic remedies. Now, do naturopathic doctors get their props? It seems like more and more people are accepting um, traditional medicine, and mm -hmm. I consider it traditional medicine and naturopathic medicine. And, and so what is that dance like with the um, Western medical community with MDs and um, with um, the most commonly used sort of medical systems in this country? What does that look like? Well, I think there's certainly uh, a variety of people in the medical profession, so I don't want to uh, characterize anyone in one in one sort of light or another, but I do think that insurance companies are at fault in terms of limiting, even when people have the knowledge and understanding that there are natural things that work better, insurance companies uh, not supporting or reimbursing patients for things that in the long run will actually save insurance companies money. So maybe it'll take, you know, a decade or so for them to see all the research and the stats and crunch the numbers and go, okay, this will save us money, so we'll do it. And I think if there is any one industry that I find particularly problematic, it would be the pharmaceutical industry uh, where they synthesize uh, compounds based on natural elements and you know, tweak it just a bit, but 
by identifying just one element, say, in a substance, like echinacea or St. John's, where you don't get the synergistic effect that you would from the full herb, um, for one. And two, uh, you can't make money off of a natural substance. At least they haven't changed those laws yet. Anyway, you can't patent a natural substance, is what I mean to say. So you can, however, patent synthetic substances. So it's in their best interest to synthesize what exists naturally, patent it, and that's how they can make their money. And I've actually heard that they are trying to patent some natural substances. Like I know for a good example is the neem tree in India, mm -hmm. which has been around for thousands and thousands of years, sort of like an entire pharmacy in one tree that was available to everyone. And fortunately, uh, the Indian people revolted and did not allow the neem tree to be patented. But I have heard the pharmaceutical companies are indeed um, patenting some of the things that are currently available to us. And um, unless we wake up and um, pay attention to what's going on, I guess, may not be available to us uh, in the future. And, and that yes. might mean, even mean access to naturopaths like you offer. No, you're absolutely right regarding that. I mean, things like stevia, which is a plant sweetener, uh, they're trying to patent. Or, you know, with the now... Um uh, uh, organically modified uh, products, genetically modified products. I mean, they're trying to patent versions of genetically modified herbs, and so therefore saying that they then own, you know, that particular lineage. Uh, what I would suggest to people to avoid anything that's genetically modified because it's not in a harmonious balance and it might take decades to understand just what uh, damage it's doing to us. But how do you know? Because when you go into, I was at the Berkeley Bowl this morning and there may have been genetically modified food there that if, unless it had the label organic. So how do we even know um, what is and what isn't. I've heard that corn is one of the vegetables that is genetically modified, and, and I didn't see any organic corn, and I was confused. Do I buy it? Do I not buy it? So how do you know when you go into um, the market? Is it just that you got to buy organic, organic, or are there certain foods that are um, more modified, more commonly modified than others? Uh, right now, soy and corn are two things that are mostly genetically modified, and corn, again, is something in terms of corn syrup that we're finding in more and more products and yes. things that you don't think about uh, that has corn in it as a base. And actually, corn syrup is not used in Europe or Japan because they're aware the corn syrup molecule, each molecule has twice as much glucose as a sugar molecule would. And that in itself, just the simple use of corn syrup is responsible uh, in a huge manner for the increase in diabetes in our country. Uh, it's not just the sugar, it's what we've done to enhance uh, the the sweetness of things way beyond sugar, and that's, that's that false flavoring of sweetness you're getting with corn syrup. But also soy has been hugely genetically modified. And basically, basically if it does not say non-GMO, non-genetically modified, uh, then you do not want to buy it. And then outside of just what's available on the produce aisle, so much of this, these genetically modified products are showing up in um, processed foods, convenience foods, and things like that, probably in huge, huge amounts. So um, yes. a, a trip to the grocery store can be can be scary these days. You're listening to About Health. I'm your host today, Rachel Bryant. My guest, Dr. Cecilia Hart. She's here in Berkeley. She's a naturopathic doctor. She's got a great website. It's www.drceciliahart.com, and it's spelled uh, Dr. D-R C-E-C-I. L I A H A R T dot com. Dr. Cecilia Hart dot com. Uh, her number is 510-499-2297. And I'll repeat that again later in the show if you didn't quite get it, but you can get her number and address and all, a lot more information on her website. Again, Dr. Cecilia Hart dot com. Today we're talking about environmental toxins and particularly how they show up in our water, air, and food. So let's get back to that conversation. Um, who needs to detox from these things. I mean, how do you know when you're at the point that you need to detox? Or are we all so sick that, you know, we think it's normal? 
So where did um, the signs and symptoms? Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, the definition, I believe, of health has just become not being, you know, critically or chronically sick. But I think optimal health, which is the goal, my goal for any patient that comes into my office, uh, is a place of balance in both uh, physical, spiritual, and emotional areas. But some of the symptoms that you might see that suggest uh, detoxification and every spring I take a group of patients through a detox program so uh, for people that are my patients it's a yearly event but some symptoms that might um, pop up to make you consider that you might have an environmental overload uh, chronic headaches mood changes including uh, anxiety and depression sinusitis uh, high cholesterol neurological disorders kidney uh, malfunction, autoimmune diseases, and that's one of my areas of focus because environmental toxicity has a lot to do with the development of autoimmune disorders. Frequent colds and flus, joint pain, fatigue, skin rashes, uh, signs of hormonal imbalance such as severe PMS or severe menopausal symptoms, brain fog, uh, fibrocystic breasts, and these are just an example of some of the things that you would look at. It's amazing, too, because there seems to be a rise in those things. Again, I don't know that my grandmother sat around and talked, or or was it unknown, but talked about things um, like, for example, um, fibroids or having so many allergies and things like that. And so as our environment has changed, obviously, and our food has changed, these things have given rise it's interesting that now there's a pill for everything. As you were reading off that list, I could think of the pharmaceutical ads that I hear for, you know, allergies now and and for um, depression and all of those things. And, and so it all leads back to environmental toxins. And so why do we need to get this stuff out of our body? I mean, obvious reasons to um, decrease these symptoms, but um, why do we need to detox and how do we do it? Uh, well, why? Because it's, it's making us sick. We're losing quality of life as well as length of life. Uh, but also the reality that there's so much we can do to bring ourselves back into balance. I mean, fibroids are almost endemic uh, in, among women of color, and that's so very uh, much linked to environmental exposure to things we call uh, uh, exogenous estrogens or things that uh, endocrine disruptors, things that look to the body, there's the chemicals that seem to the body to mimic the estrogen molecule and cause imbalances. And some of these things like PCBs are found in, oh, in paints and plastics. They make uh, things non-flammable. Uh, they're also linked uh, to breast cancer as well. Things like phthalates. Uh, those water bottles that we're all drinking that I see in my uh, Bikram yoga class, everyone drinking out of the plastic water bottle. Heat and plastic are not friends, guys. Heat and plastic causes the release of these phthalates, which again, so you're actually drinking the phthalates when you're drinking your water out of plastic bottles, and it looks at the body like an estrogen molecule. It fits into the estrogen receptor and causes just mal- hormonal malfunctioning. Uh, phthalates are uh, one example, DDTs are another example, though it was banned decades ago. It has a very long half-life, and we still find it in the soil, and also in imported produce. I want to talk about those water bottles, if we can just pause there, because if you aren't already drinking your water daily, um, and um, I know as the summer approaches, more and more people are going to be carrying water bottles around with them. And so what do you do? I mean, you go into a store and get a plastic bottle of water. I know I leave mine in my car sometimes Mm -hmm. and it heats up and I'm so thirsty I drink it and I hear what you're saying. So what are some alternatives for making sure that the water we're taking in is clean? Well, the situation with the plastic water bottles, I mean, it's not only has a huge cost to us in terms of our own health, but it's a huge environmental cost. I think it's easy to to disregard, you know, how did that water bottle make it to your local store? You know, it traveled, especially if you're drinking European water, 
how far that water traveled, how much gas and natural resources uh, were wasted in order to get that to you. Uh, so I believe filtering your own water at home is the most uh, economically efficient way to do it as well as the greatest thing for the environment as well as our bodies. And then having glass water bottles uh, and some of the metal ones, but glass is uh, my preference, and having them in your car or in your bag or in your office and just filling it up with filtered water on a regular basis. Now, some of the heavier, pl- there are heavier plastic water bottles uh, available now. Are those any different than the ones you buy in the store already filled with water? Are they They are better because phthalates are the things in plastic that cause them to be soft and flexible. So the harder the plastic is, the less phthalates they have. They still have phthalates, especially when it's exposed to heat, sitting out in the sun in the summertime um, is a big issue. So I would encourage people, again, to go with the glass. I mean, it is better to have the heavier ones, but still research in the past five years has found that those are still releasing phthalates. You're listening to About Health. I'm Rachel Bryant, your host today. We're talking to Dr. Cecilia Hart, ND, naturopathic doctor here in Berkeley. And I'd like to welcome you to give us a call if you have questions. Our topic today is environmental toxins, particularly in our water, air, and food. Um, and that's pretty much everything, I guess, is that we're covering our water, air, and our food. In the East Bay, you can give us a call, of course, in the 510 area code. Number is 848 848- Four four two five eight four eight four four two five, and outside the East Bay, call us at one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. So, you know, I consider myself in the know, and when I stroll down the aisles at the health food stores or at, at uh, Whole Foods here in Berkeley, there's so much over-the-counter stuff available for detoxification. You can do a liver detox, you can do a colon cleanse, all these things are there. Um, how do you know what you're getting is appropriate for you, and even if it, if the product in that bottle has any quality to it, I guess? Yes, that is one of the issues uh, with the natural supplement in- industry. And you know, as a naturopathic doctor, we're trained to be you know the absolute experts uh, in the field of natural medicine. And we go to visit facilities. Uh, we read uh, the lab reports, the labs you're using at certain companies. So certain companies I wouldn't even consider using, you know, not necessarily because they're bad, but because I don't know their uh, manufacturer practices. Uh, so I like to visit, you know, the farms where the herbs are being raised and see their farming practices as well as their manufacturing practices and also the the ethics of the particular companies are particularly important to me. So you actually go out and and visit the farms. And so um, is there a synergy in the way that the product is created? I mean, I, I believe this, but I'd like for you to expand upon that, because when we talk about like all the stuff that's available in Walgreens that's so mass produced versus something that's sort of homemade or or uh, made with a little more loving care, what's the difference in that? I think intention uh, has an Repeat. impact on anything. So the intention of, you know, some of the companies are using it is to produce the highest quality natural products and to, you know, improve our lives and lifestyles so that we can achieve optimal health. And that's what I look for in any companies that I work with. Great. And again, you're listening to About Health. That's Dr. Cecilia Hart. We've got quite a few callers lined up, so we'll go first to Karen in Berkeley. Karen, welcome to About Health. Thank you so much. I wanted to let everybody out there know that I found out that the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act prevents and prohibits the interstate sale of misbranded or adulterated foods. So that means that every food out there that's been genetically modified or has GMOs or bovine hormone or that does not have a label on it is actually in violation of a federal statute. So I would like to encourage everybody out there to call their congressperson, write a letter, call the newspaper, call the Penn magazine, whatever, and tell them that you are aware of this. 
Uh, or you can either call also the, the Food and Drug Administration, although they're kind of hand in hand with these people. So that is what is happening. It is an illegal act that has come upon us over the last century. And I'll tell you how I found this out. I don't know if you remember, but right at 1999, they had all these stamps collect the century, and they had every decade, 1900 to 1910, 1911 to 1920. And in this block of stamps from 1900 to 1910, it showed a stamp that commemorated the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906, and it showed Adam in the garden fighting with a skeleton uh, that was poison. And so it goes way back uh, to the most basic gift that we have been given from the ground of everything pure and natural that has been adulterated and has been misbranded or not, not branded at all with lobbyists going to Congress and saying that they don't have to tell us what's in the food. Right, so there's... Uh, actually, legally, they are all felons. Right, and there has been a move in several states, including California, to have foods uh, that are genetically modified labeled as uh, as such. Right. So I hope that we can all support that yeah. um, passing it's, in California. It's like a legal thing that, that I found out about, and so I've already written letters, and, and I'm continuously bombarding and annoying uh, as many people as I can. Um, you know, in the Congress or in the even the the uh, stores, the food stores. So thank you so much for your wonderful show, and um, I hope uh, that we can uh, overcome this big onslaught against us. Good looking out, thank Karen. You. And thank I think you. what's also interesting is that it's the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. So this was on the agenda a century ago, right, clearly exactly. a century ago. So. It's, that's a hundred years old this year. That's right. Good and looking you know what out. I'll do. I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll mail you. Um, a big blow up that I made of this stamp uh, with the information uh, to the station, and I'll try. To, I'll send it to um, uh, Doctor uh, Hart. Doctor Hart. Yeah, I'll send sure. one to Doctor Hart, and then because I just make hundreds of copies, and then I just kind of pass them out as a as a, uh, a flyer to Good. as many people as I can. Thank you so much okay. for your call. And if you would like to reach Dr. Cecilia Hart, she's here in Berkeley. Her website, Dr. Cecilia Hart, spelled H A R T. Dot com. Her number, area code 510-499-2297. We're going to go to Ian in San Francisco. Welcome to About Health, Ian. Ian, are you there? How about Julie in Larkspur? Julie, welcome to About Health. I'm a person with a very clean diet, but I have two vices. My favorite things are wine and coffee. Can you speak to the consumption of those two things and which is, is worse in, in terms of trying to be less toxic? Well, coffee, I tell all of my patients that coffee is a false friend. Uh, you know, people feel it gets them up in the morning, it gets them through the day, uh, it makes them able to focus, be more alert. In reality, it's, it's increasing um, the actual opposite symptoms. Uh, but it's it's a false illusion of these things working better, and they actually deplete your adrenal glands, which are the glands that produce cortisol, the primary stress hormone. So you actually become more and more stressed and have uh, greater difficulty uh, dealing with stress the more that you drink coffee. Uh, coffee it can also be linked to fibrocystic uh, breast disorder as well as certain things, certain female cancers, including um, uterine cancer, cervical cancer, uterine fibroids. So coffee is the one I would avoid. Wine, um, I prefer that people uh, think about doing organic wine and red because of the antioxidants is preferred uh, in small amounts, of course. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great. If you'd like to join our conversation today with Dr. Cecilia Hart, uh, we're talking about environmental toxins in the air, water, and food that we take into our bodies. In the East Bay, give us a call at 848-4425. And uh, outside the area, the number is 1-800-958-9008. We've got Ian in San Francisco. Welcome to About Health. Hello. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I was just interested in the comments about the plastic water bottles. I ride my bike constantly and, of course, in a lot of hot weather. What uh, what would be an alternative to using the plastic water bottles with athletics? 
Well, certainly hydrating before uh, using a mineral packet perhaps in the water uh, to help with that and hydrating after. But hydrating during um, is certainly important, but I think mostly before and after. And they have the metal, the lightweight metal containers are now available if glass just feels too inconvenient. Okay, yeah, so like certain which types of metals would be uh, the best option. Is it stainless steel? It seems like a lot of them are made out of stainless steel. And I, I had that same question, Ian, like is the metal, since we're talking about heavy metal um, um, toxins, does that metal release something? Yeah, the research is still out on the uh, on the metal containers because they're really a fairly new phenomenon. But uh, certainly glass is something I can recommend um, with a great deal of comfort. If you can find a glass or even having a rubber thing around your glass container if you're concerned about it breaking. Right. And uh, with uh, everybody's got a, one of those camel backs these days, too. Those and, are more. Yeah, more, and again. More Yes, and again, glass is the only thing I can safely recommend for use yeah. with water, especially when it's warm outside. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sure. Great. Let's go to Steve in Emeryville. Steve, welcome to About Health. We're talking to Dr. Cecilia Hart, a naturopathic doctor today. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. You know, um, I have arthritis, osteoarthritis in my knees, and I've been taking chondritin for years. And then recently there was an article about chondritin, not being effective at all. And when I conferred with my, uh, with the doctor, he, he agreed. He said it's probably just a waste. What do you think about chondritin and the other one, glucosamine? Yes, I think it's a combination that's usually uh, proved to be more effective. So again, I'm part of the Western scientific paradigm is to isolate a component and research that particular component. But in reality, things work best in synergy. And I think it's conjoined and combined with the glucosamine and the MSM that work the most uh, effectively. Okay, is that uh, proven? Uh, there is research supporting that, yes. Thank you very much. And so for those of us who didn't get what those things are, what are those things that he was talking about? Uh, they support uh, joint health. Basically, uh -huh. and what was the name of them? Uh, conjointin, glucosamine uh, sulfate, and MSM. And are those things that are available over the counter? Yes, absolutely. And again, I think it goes back to your earlier comment that yes, these things are available over the counter, but working with someone like yourself or another health practitioner um, gives you the expertise to look at all the things going on um, in your body, spiritually, emotionally, and and um, taking them in such a way that uh, is beneficial because. Because it seems like that you can do more harm than good or or feel like you're not getting the results because mm -hmm. maybe you're not taking it correctly or in combination. Um, exactly. Um, take something, for example, like calcium. I mean, there's certainly lots of research showing how beneficial calcium is. But if it's taken the wrong way or certain forms of it, it can not only cause uh, problems, but wind up being a waste. You just don't break it down very well. Uh, like the calcium sources from the, the coral calcium has become you know, a new phenomenon as well as uh, some of the bone meal. But actually we're finding a lot of heavy metals in some of those forms of calcium because the bone is one of the places you store heavy metals. So those are not forms that I suggest. Um, certainly taking uh, the lesser... Uh, absorbable forms of calcium, which are available in places like Walgreens or Longs. You're actually, you know, you might think you're saving money. You're actually probably wasting your money because you're not absorbing much of it. Most of it you're just flushing down into the water supply. Hmm. All right. Let's go to Dave in Oakland. Dave, welcome to About Health. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on. I have a couple questions uh, concerning omega threes. I uh, I have a uh, some joint problems and I've basically been uh, uh, diagnosed with a fibromyalgia and depression. And I found that omega threes, particularly a fish meal, uh, helps quite a bit. But I'm concerned about two things: taking the uh, the omegas in a, a capsule or, or um, fluid and uh, number one is uh, problems with toxicity in fish oils, and number two, digestion. I have problems with digestion taking these. Okay. In terms of toxicity, uh, there are a few companies uh, that 
only a few companies that I would use uh, fish oil products from, and I make sure that they're um, both um, distilling, molecularly distilling the fish oil, so that that removes the mercury as well as the DDTs, uh, and dioxins, and all these potentially uh, negative things that you would find in some of the fish have been removed. There are, unfortunately, a lot of over-the-counter fish oil products that are still have uh, mercury toxins as well as um, dioxins and the uh, PCBs in them, and uh, those are often less expensive, and again, you'll find at some of those bigger chain stores. Uh, so people who don't know just get a little bit of information and wind up buying them and may well be doing themselves more harm than good. And what about flaxseed oil? Uh, flaxseed uh, has a lot of benefits, but it also feeds into a pro-inflammatory uh, pathway. So unlike fish oil, which only feeds into a biochemical pathway that decreases inflammation, flaxseed can potentially cause some inflammation. So it's a mixed bag, and it really depends on what the, uh, the person's other health issues are, and their diet and lifestyle, determining whether or not I would have them use flaxseeds. Okay. And uh, digestion or enzymes, using enzymes with those? Yes. And, and again, I would want to take more of a history, but I am a big fan of uh, digestive enzy enzymes in general. Okay. That helps you break down the products and get uh, more of the nutrients out of them as well as making them less allergenic or causing or potentially causing inflammation inside the, uh, the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Sure. Are a lot of us sick in our GI tract and don't know it? I think a lot of things that people assume normal that we're getting in our media, oh, you know, you're bloating after a meal, I've taken antacid, or um, a reflux, and people think they're common, or taking uh, some of the pharmaceutical ads that I've seen. I actually don't have television. I'm always shocked when I see some of the commercials. Uh, that's that are happening. Uh, these are not the ideal state of digestion. We shouldn't be experiencing that. And there are some simple um, naturopathic uh, principles and things that we can do to avoid them. They're usually a sign that you're really not um, breaking down your food efficiently, or your food might in fact be uh, causing toxic effects in the body. Okay, we've got uh, a caller on hold here, but before I go to Heather and San Rafael, I'm going to give the number out again. If you've got a question for Dr. Cecilia Hart, give us a call in the East Bay, 848-4425, 848-4425, and uh, outside the area, 1-800-958-9008. Now let's go to Heather and San Rafael. Welcome to About Health. Hi. Hi. Uh I'm um, I'm wondering about mate, yerba mate. I heard that it was that it didn't contain caffeine, but it contained something similar, but not caffeine. And I heard that it was actually healthy for you. Well, you know, I'm always a bit skeptical when any new, especially botanical, comes on the market and it's being pushed as you know the new cure all because. You know, honestly, if it's a bot botanical, it's been around for thousands of years, probably, and uh, someone knew about it for quite a while, so it's really not that new. Uh, and yerba mate can uh, cause uh, some issues in the bladder. It's high in tannins, uh, which is something... Uh, that can stick to the lining of your bladder as well as the, the components in it that are similar caffeine-like products, therefore causing similar results that you would um, see with the use of coffee. So I'm not a big fan of yerba mate. Is it even worse than coffee? Uh, that I'm not sure on, but I know it's not something that I recommend to people because I know there are some negative components to it. Is there anything that um, you would recommend for, like, you know, for for actual energy? Uh, certainly a balanced diet, uh, B vitamins, green tea. I'm a big fan of the green tea, the rehoboth, some of the African teas, the honey bush. They're high in antioxidants. Um, that's where I'd start. Thank you so much. Sure. Bye. What about chocolate? I know there's been, and I'm just such a fan of chocolate and loving to hear that um, chocolate um, there might be health benefits. Of course, they're talking about the dark chocolate and things like that. But um, 
What about chocolate? Is it an advertising and marketing ploy to get us to eat more? I don't need much of a push, but what about chocolate? What do you know? Well, certainly the least processed um, forms are more beneficial. You're getting more antioxidants. Um, those are the darker, pure chocolates. Uh, but uh, consumption of too much chocolate can uh, certainly have an impact in terms of fibrocystic breast. Uh, so it's not something I'm going to encourage someone to have, you know, a big bar every day, but certainly a uh, small amount in moderation. We certainly have to enjoy our lives, too, and cer- chocolate can be a part of that pleasure mechanism just based on some of the neurotransmitters it helps to release in the brain. I know that's right. And just going back to what Heather was asking about, I know that I was used to be a coffee drinker, and it just took time to get off the coffee. Um, I think I went from regular to decaf to black tea to green tea and now to Rubio's tea, but it took some time and, and maybe a couple of years to completely get off of the caffeinated beverages, but um, it can be done. Yeah, I d- Mm-hmm. I definitely don't suggest like quitting coffee cold turkey if you've been doing three or four cups a day because you can just have some terrible rebound headaches with that. So reducing, like starting, you know, 25% less, do that for a month, and then the next 25% the next month while increasing the other teas or uh, just diluting it. Uh, but it's one of those things that people have a hard time stopping because. You know, the cold, cold turkey approach is often not successful. And what I eventually found is that I had a better gauge on my energy, that in fact coffee was producing sort of false energy in my body, and then I would crash down and, and just sort of getting off of the caffeine, I'm better able to gauge that maybe I just need to go to bed earlier, or maybe I need... um you know, some more vegetables or whatever it was, I was more in tune with what my body was calling for versus the sort of roller coaster that the that the coffee came up brought up in my in my body. And I know there's some diehard coffee drinkers out there, so um, we're certainly not wanting to um, give a blanket response to everybody or make you feel bad about your choices. Right. Certainly an occasional cup of coffee is fine. And certainly, you know, there's some wonderful coffees out there. So I'm not saying never have coffee. But if coffee is the way that you get up in the morning, it's what you need to get through the day, uh, then there's a problem. All right. Let's go back to the phone lines. Amy in Petaluma, welcome to About Health. Amy, how about uh, a caller from Sonoma County? Welcome to About Health. Oh, Amy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, hi, Amy. Hi. Welcome to About Health. Hi, thank you. I was calling um, about allergies. You had mentioned at the beginning um, about environmental um, issues connected to allergies, and um, I haven't really heard you address that um, in particular to allergies, and especially right now, um, my husband. Uh, has horrible allergies and it just happened within the past five years and we moved out of the Bay Area to see if that would make a difference and it's gotten worse. Obviously, we live in a, a more pollen-ridden um, uh, environment, but um, it just has gotten worse and worse and we have a very um, healthy home style and lifestyle and it's um, surprising how bad it's gotten um, within the past two years. Yeah, I would uh, bet that there's a big use of pesticides and herbicides in your area that might be impacting his overall immune response. I mean, allergies, although people think of them as, you know, a normal thing to have, they're actually a sign that your immune system is overloaded with toxins. And uh, one of the things that I do with patients is to identify what those toxins might be uh, through various forms of testing, including blood tests for food sensitivities, which have a huge impact in the allergies that you're talking about, as well as a urinalysis for heavy metal and environmental toxin exposure. So those are the places we would start and then eliminating um, the causes as much as we're able to and increasing his body's ability, you know, to fight whatever is weakening it. Why would it um, only affect him and not myself or my daughter? Well, each of us is an individual with a different blueprint and maybe you don't have the same toxin overload and also, you know, what we inherit from our parents is our ability to clear toxins. There are certain pathways, you know, in the liver that that's their job and the efficiency of that pathway has a lot to do with our genetics. Okay. So you would 
because he's he's been tested for allergies and he's been tested for eczema because he's had like you know breakouts in his hands and then his eyes and uh, none of this you know no environmental connection has been drawn oh well they didn't do the test for the environmental yeah. connection then i, I and I'm particularly referring to I'm um, doing your analysis yeah. for you know things uh, like exposures to phthalates and and the DDT and the dioxins. Okay. Um, that's that's what I'm referring to or sterines. Yeah, and so then doing the heavy metal test, uh, we're giving a chelator for excess exposure to things like lead or mercury, mm-hmm. as well as a food sensitivity blood test. Where I'm looking specifically at the IgG antibodies, not the IgE, which the conventional uh, medicine uses. Uh, that's the immediate response, so they can see it right there in the office. Okay. I look at the delayed response, which is IgG, and that's a blood test, and look at what foods are causing that delayed response, which causes gut inflammation, and then things exactly like you mentioned, like the eczema, psoriasis, mm-hmm. the hay fever. Right. So that's where I'd start. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. And if you'd like to get a hold of Dr. Cecilia Hart, she's here in Berkeley. Her number is 510 499 Two two nine seven. She's also got a great website. It's drceciliahart.com, and her last name is spelled H-A-R-T. Drceciliahart.com. You also do some local um, workshops and, and talks, and tell me more about what you're doing locally, outside of your office, your practice. I work uh, one day a week for a few hours with Elephant Pharmacy, so actually once a month I give a free public lecture, and this month we're doing uh, headaches, including migraine headaches, on the 15th. June 15th? Yes, You can correct. get that on your website, though, right? Yes, okay. all the dates of all the uh, upcoming talks are always listed there, and that's updated uh, weekly. And I've done talks on subjects from uh, PMS, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, environmental, toxin exposure. Uh, and I do a wide range of, of uh, topics that are particularly uh, focused on autoimmune diseases as well as chronic diseases because there is a big link between environmental toxins and the development of those disorders. All right, we've got time for some more calls uh, in the East Bay. Uh, chime in at 848 848- Four four two five, and outside the area one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. We've got someone who's been holding from Sonoma County. Welcome to About Health. Oh hi, um, I'm calling because I've been taking Spectrum essential oils, and I don't know what you think about those, but um. I'm I'm sort of leery because you said mackerel is not a good fish and it's got mackerel in it and it says on the um, front of the label it says no mercury PCB lead but I don't know if that means anything. Right. Does it tell you how that they've gotten rid of those things on label? I'm not familiar yes, with that brand and I am not a big fan. I'm just trashing brands. I'm okay with trashing <laughs> Walgreens or Longs though. Well, so if you got it there, it's probably not very good. Third party purity tested. That's all it says. Okay, it sounds like a reasonable brand, uh, but we're looking for words like molecularly distilled and then free of those things that you mentioned. But unfortunately, some companies are allowed to get away with, although it's illegal, putting things on the label. So unless I really know their manufacturing practices, Mm -hmm. I'm cautious to say, oh, yes, that's fine, but it does sound good. So you're saying mercury. Um, can be in mackerel, though. Yes, it is highly concentrated in mackerel, uh, Mm -hmm. but if they are using those processes to pull out the mercury, then the product would be free of it. Okay. Well, thanks. It doesn't say anything about that, though. (laughs) Okay. Okay, Well, good luck, and um, certainly there are reliable um, health food stores in Berkeley. We do have Elephant Pharmacy, which I know people are... There, I've been impressed with how well educated a lot of the staff there is regarding the products, so that's another great place. Great. Now, we've been talking about environmental toxins in our uh, water, air, and food, but we get junk in our bodies from um, other sources as well, like cosmetics, so nail polish, Absolutely. shampoo. Talk a little bit Absolutely. about that. Absolutely. 
the parabens, uh, the nail polish, shampoo, eye collar, the lead in mascara, uh, a lot of the cosmetics, hair products, soaps, and again, guys, the three words, organic, organic, organic. Look for um, those products. Uh, look for things that are coconut oil-based um, is another uh, good way to go. And I think it's worth spending a little extra money or maybe even making your own. There's certainly some wonderful um, books and even videos for making, making your own soaps and cosmetics and shampoos and lotions. So consider that. Okay, we're going to go to Monica from Oakland. Monica, welcome to About Health. Yes, thanks for the great show. Um, do you have any recommendations for um, hot flashes? Uh, well, I would start with uh, getting a more of a history regarding uh, hot flashes. Are you in the perimenopausal or menopausal years? Yes. Okay. Uh, diet can have a lot to do with uh, with hot flashes because... Again, it's the estrogen uh, that's causing, and it's what we call the bad forms of estrogen that can make the hot flashes worse. So the things I mentioned earlier are to help detox the liver, because the liver really is the clearing ground for the hormones, those cruciferous vegetables, certainly giving up things like caffeine and alcohol and sugar, uh, and there's certain herbs that will help, um, will detox the liver also, like milk thistle and burdock. Uh, black radish is another one I'm a big fan of. Uh, also, uh, with the hot flashes, uh, think about some uh, extracts or more pharmaceutical grade uh, natural components uh, like NAC, uh, calcium deglucurate, and uh, glutathione. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. And... Tell me a little bit more about your website because I know you've got some other information on there as well. So if people went to your website, one, they could get a hold of you. And again, everyone has a unique blueprint mm -hmm. and, and it's hard to generalize because you would work with someone based on their history and their family history and looking at their whole person mentally, spiritually and the physical body. Mm -hmm. um, what are some other things um, on your website? On the website, it gives that... Uh, allows people to connect to some of the organizations that are involved in naturopathic medicine, such as the Bureau of Naturopathic Medicine, the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, uh, as well as link to the uh, five uh, naturopathic uh, medical schools in North America are there. Also, the intake form, if you wanted to come in as a new patient, that's a good place to have it. Uh, again, explaining a little bit about the history and the different um, healing modalities they use in naturopathic medicine, such as botanicals, nutraceuticals, those are things like the calcium deglucurate I mentioned, homeopathy, bioidentical hormones, uh, hydrotherapy and clinical nutrition uh, and it also uh, lists the different sort of testing we do which include uh, again urinalysis for environmental exposure we also do genomic testing to see what your inherited uh, risks are for developing certain disorders Okay, and again, that website is drceciliahart.com. Her last name spelled H-A-R-T, drceciliahart.com. Her phone number in Berkeley is 510-499-2297, uh, 510-499-2297. Four nine nine two two nine seven. We're going to squeeze in one more call quickly. Nancy from Fresno. Hello. Hi. Welcome to About Health. We've got about a minute. Thank you. I'll just present it quickly. I love your show. Thank Breakfast. you. Uh, the question I had is about a year and a half ago, I finished up radiation for breast cancer. And I'm doing very well. I feel fine. But I've been concerned about any kind of residual radiation that I might have, if there's anything I can take to fix and eliminate it. Well, there are, and it would depend on, you know, what sort of radiation, if you did chemo, what sort of cancer, estrogen receptor sensitive uh, or not, or progesterone uh, sensitive. So there are a lot of factors. Unfortunately, breast cancer is a little more complex. Uh, and that I would work more on an individual level. But in terms of general information regarding radiation, things like kelp and seaweeds are things that help you detox from radiation. And how would I take the kelp? Because I do have kelp. I just got some. Um, 
And Nancy, I think it's probably best for you to contact Dr. Cecilia Hart. Her fo- her website is uh, ceciliahart.com. Her phone number 510-499-2297. And I'd like to stress probably one of the most important points is, yes, there's a lot of stuff out there, but it's so important to work with someone like yourself who, who knows what they're doing or, or you can do more harm than good. Thank you for joining us today on About Health. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much, Rachel. Come to an educational forum, Palestine, Sudan, and the myth of a humanitarian U.S. foreign policy on Tuesday, June 13 at 7 p.m. Speakers will include Jeff Ghanem, Free Palestine Alliance and Answer, and Ismael Kamal, co-founder of Sudanese American Society. That is Tuesday, June 13, 7 p.m. at the San Francisco Women's Building, 3543 18th Street. A 5 to $10 donation benefits the ongoing work of the Answer Coalition. For more information, call 415-821-6545.